Um, hello and welcome, uh, I guess again, um, to another Armets talk. Um, thanks for coming along. Uh, tonight is the annual Yorkshire Centre um, PhD showcase where we have three second year PhD students from the Institute of Climate Atmospheric Science that's here. They're going to be talking about their work doing, well, quite as you'll see, quite a range of um, stuff in the fields of meteorology and climate. And we move on to our second speaker, um, who is Hazel, who's also studied in Yorkshire all the time. She did her undergraduate degree here in Leeds doing environmental science. And then after that, did her master's here at um, doing climate and environment policy alongside working at the Bank, bank of Carbon. You, you, you tell me the, the U, United, bank. United Bank of Carbon. There we are. Um, and yeah, I will hand over to her and stop butchering what she does. Um. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. Um, so my project is um, all about woodland expansion and it, it's kind of positioned in the context of climate change mitigation, but I'm looking at it more from an air quality perspective. Um, so we're looking at how large scale woodland creation will impact air quality here in the UK. Um, and I've included some kind of background on climate change just to jog everyone friendly before we get into the nitty gritty. So um, firstly, the fact that we really need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C to avoid the most severe impacts of climate change. Um, we know that this is going to really help us in avoiding um, the most severe impacts and actually the pathways that have been set out so far in, in the science that look at this temperature um, still rely quite heavily on the terrestrial biosphere um, because of the amount of emissions that we need to reduce that are still quite difficult to deal with. Um, we are already experiencing some of the extremes of climate change here in the UK, including heat waves, drought and flooding, and I've got some uh, images of that in a minute. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, so the pathways that we will take to uh, mitigate climate change um, rely heavily on the terrestrial biosphere, and um, one will see that going through its presentation. So the plot on the right hand side is from the IPCC summary report that came out just last week, and to just draw your attention to this section at the top, and uh, you can see how um, hottest day temperature change increases as um, the world uh, warming increases, and, and of course that will correspond with more uh, frequent extremes. So this is just some examples of those extremes we've seen in the UK um, with the hottest temperatures and record recorded last summer. And um, this is taken from the Met Office and you can see that those figures uh, reached above 40 degrees in several places. And then earlier um, this year, we saw um, again record highs of flooding and this is in York where I live actually. And quite often we can't, we can't do the walk that we normally do every day with our dog because it's just clean water. Um, so I'm going to end up talking about trees, and it's just worth pointing out here that trees can actually help us on a more daily basis to deal with some of these stresses because they provide shade, they help to capture rainfall as it comes down, slow the flow, and so there's kind of, you know, more immediate benefits that we get from trees. But the biggest thing I'm going to be talking about today is how they help us to mitigate climate change through the taking up of CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it in their biomass. And that's why trees are such a huge part of climate change mitigation. And you can see in this plot, which is again from the IPCC summary report, that um, this, this second row, where there's the orange and the yellow bars, that is areas of mitigation, um, which rely on some kind of uh, change in, in forests and um, the biosphere. So we've got how we, our forests, how we um, restore forests that have been degraded, and how we manage agriculture and um, conservation and uh, sustainable forestry as well. And those that are reaching further across uh, are those um, areas which are able to make more substantial contributions to mitigating climate change. So to bring this onto a UK scale, um, in 2019, the Committee on Climate Change recommended that to achieve net zero um, greenhouse gases by 2050, that we planted 30,000 to 50,000 hectares of trees every year. And this um, bright green section I've just highlighted is the role that afforestation plays in getting to that 100% reduction. So again, it's making up quite a high proportion here. And it was estimated that if we were to plant on the lower end of the scale, so the 30,000 hectares, as well as doing more active woodland management, that we could increase the net forest sink by 
22 megatons every year for uh, 2030. But planting trees on this scale is going to be a massive challenge. So um, this plot here is woodland planting rates. And we've achieved this rate of planting before in the late 80s, um, but this was done on an unsustainable scale. And um, we planted lots of the same species, which is really bad for biodiversity. And it was more of a sort of like quick win sort of thing. Um, and since then, our uh, wood inflation rates have really gone down. And so it's going to be a huge challenge for us to get back up to that scale. And actually, we recognise that we have a, a major lack of workforce in the forestry sector as well. So that's a big challenge. Oh, sorry. Um, this plot on the right hand side is forest cover, and that's just showing just how small the percentage cover is of the UK compared to other, um, other nations. And that's important because we know that trees are providing loads of different benefits, and the less trees we have, the less likely we are able to access those benefits. And um, they're actually unevenly distributed as well, so there's some communities that have uh, disproportionate access. So, there's lots of different benefits that trees are providing in addition to helping to mitigate climate change. And one of those that we often think of is air quality. So we know that trees can help clean the air because pollutants can be deposited on the leaf surface and on the bark, and that reduces localised concentrations of some major pollutants. But there is another problem, which is that they, um, trees can actually be detrimental to the air quality because they emit what's called BVACs, which is biogenic volatile organic compounds. And they're essentially um, compounds that the trees emit naturally as a way of um, communicating within their ecosystem, letting each other know when they're under pressure and under stress, such as during a drought. Um, so it's a natural process, and there's lots of different versions of these BVOCs. So isoprene is a key one that's emitted by oak, and monoterpenes are more characteristic of pine trees. And the emissions of these um, are controlled by temperature, leaf age, CO2, etc. So not only um, is it important for us to understand these if we're going to be planting lots more trees, but we also want to know how these are affected by climate change itself. So um, this plot here in the title is a bit hidden, but this is um, global emissions of isoprene, which is the number one emitted BVOC. And you can see that they're predominantly in the tropics. And very little is visible for the UK. But the key point here is really that um, we've kind of thought in the past that these didn't matter too much for the UK because we didn't have that many trees. But now we're going to be planting on a huge scale. That tiny little area of purple is becoming um, very important. So how exactly do BVOCs affect the atmosphere? So they are precursors to some major pollutants in the atmosphere. So when they're processed in different ways, they can end up producing higher concentrations of ozone and particulate matter in different places. Um, and it's worth saying that this really depends on where you are. So if you make changes to anthropogenic emissions, the cycling is very different and the role of BVOCs is greater or less depending on those things. Um, but we, of course, care about this because pollution is really detrimental to human health and air quality is the number one environmental hazard to health in Europe. Um, so, so understanding how BVOC concentrations are going to change under large-scale afforestation is really important. And I think it's just worth highlighting that we currently think really good at trees to help us manage climate change, but there's just a whole host of other things to consider. So um, you might be thinking, am I saying that tree planting is a bad thing? I am definitely not saying that tree planting is a bad thing. Because, um, as I say, it's immensely complicated. Um, the chemistry is very complicated and the changes that we make to emissions from vehicles and industry, etc., will impact whether trees matter in different places. Um, also, the climate that the trees are growing under is really important and the species that we plant as well. And I'll come on to that again in a minute. And then we've also got to remember that trees have a role outside of climate change for biodiversity and for health and well-being, etc. So um, we don't want to just think about climate. So that's where my project comes in. So essentially, I'm trying to identify um, what different afforestation scenarios to achieve climate targets are set out um, by the Pluto climate change, what those different scenarios could do for air quality by studying the emissions of these BVOCs. So we start off by thinking about the land as parcel made up of lots of different um, land cover types. And we're looking at um, where can we deliver this percentage change? So the targets will deliver approximately a 6% increase. So 
where can we take that from? Where is it plausible that these trees um, will survive under the climates that we think we're going to experience? Um, it's worth noting that I am not delving into kind of the political social side of like where it's appropriate to plant that's kind of another project but um, yeah so starting with land and cover and then we have to think about what trees will actually be planted so this is a whole host of trees that could be planted but to just draw your attention to two um, oak is a really high emitter of isoprene um, but it emits almost no monocotons and then beech is kind of the reverse. So I've got a whole host of trees that I've been analysing, which I kind of know what BVACs they emit and whether they've been identified to be suitable um, to plant longer term because of how they'll be resilient against climate change. And I'm narrowing those down to sort of build up my scenarios of what species mixtures we're going to be planting in this model. And then um, because we want to know how this is going to change in the climate change, we're looking at some heat wave events that have already occurred. So we can, um, in the model, we can see how with that meteorology, those temperatures, how the emissions of BVOCs changed in that circumstance, then introduce the afforestation scenarios and see how they perform, because then we've got a way of ground treating whether, um, whether the emissions in, in the model are, are actually realistic. Um, yeah, and that's everything. Thanks. Thanks, Hazel. Um, are there any questions? In that case, then I'll ask. Um, so, oh, sorry, didn't see her. Sorry. Um, so, I'm wondering um, if you can ask sort of like in the great world of questions in my own mind. Um, I'm not as like a sports member, so. Excuse me, if it's so advanced, but I'm wondering to what extent um, if you've ever used or think about using sort of paleo-environmental data to, um, I guess, plan strategies of what trees would be beneficial from what areas. So, like, how work is big for sort of history and like Mesolithic, Neolithic, and maybe some of the tree types and how we're uncertain if it would be beneficial as opposed to other areas. So, the trees on four trees or even the yeah. that really just be different. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. So um, the Forestry Commission have actually done loads of work um, across the whole of the UK. They've done lots of modelling and you can kind of literally look at a small area. So you could look at Leeds, for example, and they've modelled for a whole host of species how that tree would perform under lots of different scenarios. So you could break this down on a very local scale, look at lots of different species and say, OK, I'm not going to put any of that one here because it's not going to perform well. But in terms of thinking about places further north, further south, we also want to think about for climate resilience, we'd like to plant um, trees that have grown at slightly warmer temperatures so that they're more used to it. So we'll be looking at seed sources from, from further south at the moment. Um, and introducing those. So the model that I will use will capture species that have been kind of approved that they, they're both likely to be suitable on a more immediate scale and have that longevity as well. Uh, really great talk, thank you. Um, I was just curious, you said um, with this, is it B-Box? Yeah. Yes. At what point did people realise that trees emitted this and was it a real like, oh no, we're we thought we loved trees moment, or was it kind of a, okay, it's fine? <laughs> oh, I know, that. I think the negativity that comes with it like makes me a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, we have we have known about it for a long time, and it's been quite widely studied. Not so much in the UK; it's really widely studied in the US. Um, but I think because it depends so much on the influence of other pollutants and 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 kind of location specific, that we've never kind of thought about it too much. Um, we know that it can be detrimental in some places, but there's all, there's so many different things at play, such as like. Um, a tree that might be really beneficial for air quality on a roadside, if those trees are suddenly planted really densely, can actually suddenly become detrimental because of the way that like the air kind of flows around them. So there's just so much at play. It's really hard to yeah, to really kind of capture how much of an issue it is. Um, but um, there was a big study done in the UK in the early 2000s that said, um, basically, we don't need to worry about BBOCs in the UK. And here we are now wanting to plant like 
host, hosts and hosts of trees and um, voice data assets. Um, is it you are Putting out all the different things like location and climate, and you talked a bit about that. But like in your model, when you feel like you're going to do, how much are you going to like want to be able to like take into account all those different things like biodiversity? Because as you've been saying, like it, the what trees you plant, the, the climate resilience sort of stuff, like how much of that is it important to balance? Um, how it is going to impact biodiversity by So um, there's I kind of got two answers. So. The thing that I was saying about like, no, they're not bad, um, kind of take a step back from thinking about air quality. And I'm more kind of saying there that we're not just going to pick trees to plant based on whether they are bad for air quality and good for climate change. Um, what I was referring more to is like delivering all the benefits, continuing to deliver all the benefits and seeing it in that broader context. But specifically in terms of like, how do we capture biodiversity within trees that are climate resilient? And um, it is about like being really conscious about knowing that that tree is going to be resilient, but also trying to source source trees um, that have you know grown up in like, grown in environments that are quite similar and have supported similar species, so that as they are introduced, they're not hope they're hopefully going to like serve a similar purpose within that ecosystem. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions online. Yeah. Ask um, if so. You said like the UK got the lowest amount of woodlands in Europe, and how. And I was wondering, like, if we if we achieve our sort of targets, what does that look like in terms of how much that's going to change? Um, it... Like, so it's it would take us from thirteen percent of our cover to seventeen to nineteen percent. All right, okay. so, so, like, it's totally like one a lot. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, hey, thanks very much. Um, I think we'll move on to our final speaker, but in the meantime, let's have another round of applause for um, So yeah, our um, final speaker is Asha, um, who didn't do their um, undergrad in Yorkshire, but they didn't do it in Lancashire, so it's all right. Uh, is in Oxford and uh, did an integrated master's in earth science. And I will hand over to them to um, give their wonderful talk. I'm just, I'm, just breaking my, I'm just breaking my fast, but it's okay. Um, so, there we go. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Asha. Um, I'm the Amsterdam and Cloud Dynamics group here at Leeds. Um, and yeah, my, type, my talk is called Putting Pieces Together, the Meteorological Jigsaw, or the Maritime Constant, because as I've rec recently realised, with the work I'm doing, there's loads of different avenues, and he's probably gathered from Amy and Hazel talks. There's a lot of layers to what we do, and I've recently realized there's too many layers. So <laughs> let's go on a little journey and learn about this jigsaw. So the maritime continent is this region in Southeast Asia. So countries such as Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, um, Papua New Guinea, as an archipelago home to around 500 million people. So lots of people from different backgrounds and socioeconomic groups to live around the various islands in the region. It's located within this region called the Indo-Pacific Warm Pool, which is a region of high sea surface temperatures, sometimes up to 30 degrees, so 25 to 30, um, stemming, spanning from the eastern Indian Ocean to the West Pacific Ocean. And because you have these really high sea surface temperatures in the waters, and you have quite variable um, elevation in the region. So you can see that in regions, it goes to above 3000 meters. Um, the mixture of the sea surface temperatures and the mountains makes the environment really conducive to forming deep convection, which can release um, a lot of energy into the atmosphere and also form extreme rainfall. So a lot of my research is focusing on addressing the different patterns, um, the extreme rainfall across the region and the rainfall that this experience is twice the global mean. So in regions you get above about 20 millimeters a day, which is a large amount. And some authors of, um, in this field call this region atmospheric boiler box because the rainfall that's produced in the region and all the storm formation, the convection, release a lot of energy into the atmosphere and it can drive um, global climate response. So it sends out these signals, you can imagine like 
different waves sent out up to the atmosphere and then propagating in the upper levels of the atmosphere around the globe, both in terms of like the latitudes and the longitudes. Um, and as you can see in this little figure I made on the side, so the top figure is the um, mean rainfall for December to February. So it's roughly the, um, the summer monsoon for the, the region. And the bottom is June to August, which is the, uh, the winter monsoon. Um, as you can see that there are loads of different rainfall hotspots. You can see off of Sumatra and Indonesia, um, near Borneo and Papua New Guinea in the summer, and up towards Thailand and the west part of the Philippines in the winter, but also still in New Guinea. Um, and this is the large scale patterns in rainfall are dictated by these shifts in the seasonal position of the intertropical convergence zone, which is basically where the trade winds which are driven by the solar heating of the, the planet and the convergence of the trade winds, bringing all the moisture and warm temperatures together. And you also get a change in the monsoonal winds. So you can see that in the summer, you have these winds circulating down towards Indonesia, then going eastward. And then in the winter, they move further north. And these are the winds that are usually associated with the Indian monsoon. So off of this map, you're able to see there's some curving towards like Bangladesh and India. Um, and as a result of this extreme rainfall and all the things going on here, um, the communities are really high, really susceptible to disaster and loss through flooding, landslides, results in displacement and other um, hazards that are ongoing in the region. So understanding the patterns in rainfall in this region is really important, especially with the ability of current forecasts and models in reproducing the rainfall patterns. And this is where I introduced the concept of this jigsaw because there's many different factors which can influence rainfall patterns over the maritime continent. And it's the main part of my research really. And so I'll introduce the first one. So there are various large scale circulations and one is the Madame Julian oscillation, which is also known as the MJO. And it's the largest, the most dominant control on tropical variability in rainfall and climate. And it's this eastward propagating convective anomaly. So you can see in blue with clouds, it propagates from west to east around the globe with suppressed areas of rainfall either side. And that's just one of the biggest controls on rainfall here. We also have other large scale circulations, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So you probably heard a lot about this in terms of El Nino and La Nino events. And this is driven by sea surface temperature anomalies in the central eastern Pacific Ocean. So usually when it comes to looking at the circulation related to ENSO, you have cooler surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific driven by the upwelling of coastal waters near Chile and you have warmer waters in the West Pacific. And because of the temperature gradient, you get winds that flow from east to west. And that drives this circulation, which forms convection and rainfall in the Eastern Maritime Continent. During the El Nino phase, the cold water upwelling is diminished and that warm water moves eastward. And because of that, you weaken the winds, the region of convection moves further towards the Pacific Ocean and you don't get as much rainfall over the Maritime Continent. On the other hand, with La Nina events, you get the opposite. So the cold water moves further westward and the whirlpool concentrates over the maritime constant and the winds build up again and you get the rainfall over Southeast Asia. Another piece you can think about is the overall tectonic arrangement. So in the Cenozoic, around 66 million years ago, that's where the whole Archipelago, archipelago formed, and as a result of all the islands being plonked in the middle of the, uh, the warm pool, you get this distinct diurnal cycle, so the daily cycle of solar heating, and the patterns in rainfall linked to the diurnal cycle are unique to each island because of their various shapes, geometries, and locations, but there's a similar trend that goes on in certain areas. So here I've put um, regions where you get really strong diurnal cycles, so during the day, you get heating of the land, which produces a pressure gradient. So heating the land brings um, the, the winds from offshore regions onto land. And as a result, you get convection and rainfall falling, forming over the islands. Great. And then overnight, you get cooling of the islands and that reverses the pressure gradient. So you get these offshore winds and that allows this convection to propagate offshore and intensify further. There's a lot of ongoing research into this. One of my supervisors is very keen on this at the moment. So I've introduced 
three of these pieces in terms of understanding the puzzle of the maritime constant. But there are many other controls in large scale environment that don't need to go too much into. And there are other finer scale controls in space and time. And these are only just a couple of them. There's many of them out there. And the biggest question is their scale interactions are how they interact with one another. So you can see this is how they swap around. They each have a connection to one another. There's a lot of layers to understanding how each of them interact. So in my first year, I looked a lot of the interactions between the jet stream, which is further south of the maritime constant, and how that somehow causes rainfall patterns over the maritime constant to deviate from the mean. So there's a lot of different processes going on. And we have this somewhat complete jigsaw, but you may notice that I've kept the edges unfilled. So how do we do this? We use the various methods which um, have been discussed already today. So we can use observations. So these include flight campaigns, which can fly through storms and get ideas of how the clouds form, how rainfall form, how, how the rainfall is, ends up being produced. You can also use weather balloons or radio suns, which you can get atmospheric profiles to understand how they form, but also rain gauges to collect rainfall and get a more accurate picture of how much rainfall is being uh, released at that location. But in the maritime constant, the observational network is very sparse, so you don't have a good distribution in terms of these observations. So the next step is to use satellite data, so you can look at the temperature of um, the brightness temperature of clouds, determining how deep the convection is, and therefore is somewhat a good proxy for how much rainfall you're getting. But you can also use radar to actually get um, an insight of what, how much rainfall is forming. You can use reanalysis data sets. So these are like best estimates using forecast models and existing observations. So basically fill in the gaps of observation satellite data to get an insight into what variables such as temperature, humidity, may be contributing, contributing to the formation of extreme rainfall in the region. And you have a whole host of models out there. You have ones that can represent convection, some that can't, some that have finer resolution, some have coarser resolution, some that use things like machine learning to as a predictive tool, um, forecast models. Um, you have to use all these four uh, in conjunction with one another to basically piece together the jigsaw and basically complete it. But as you may have gathered, there's a lot of ongoing research. So this Technically, this closure of that jigsaw doesn't exist yet. And that's basically the premise of my research. So just to summarize, the maritime continent is one of the wettest regions on Earth, and it contributes to global climate, global and local climate. And there are many features which influence extreme rainfall patterns from the large scale circulations to the finer scale, more transient processes. Um, and because of there's so because there's so many interactions between each of these features which regulate precipitation patterns, you have to use loads of different methods and data sets to basically get an idea of what's going on, which is a struggle in research because you you hope that you get the answer from one data set, but then you realize oh there's a whole host of other things you can use to basically give make those answers more concrete and. What I'm hoping is that ongoing research will be beneficial to both the local communities and decision makers, particularly for forecasts, because some of the forecasts struggle to capture the timing or strength of these convective and rainfall systems. Um, so working with people who work on the grounds, but also other researchers across the globe on these problems related to the maritime constant, but other areas of the world which can also work. So there's a lot of work of people work studying the Indian monsoon because some of the processes are similar. It's just that the maritime constant has a geography that makes it really complicated. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Hasha. Um, do you have any questions to kick off with? Amy? Thank you, that was a really nice talk. I, I love the fact you need satellites to have clouds in and I'm like get rid of all the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question was about the oscillations. So you mentioned that they're really kind of sparse in, in this region in terms of the kind of network of, of oscillations. Um, I kind of have two questions. Do you see that changing? Is it kind of going in the right direction? And also the actual kind of campaigns that might be on the flights, what what are the kind of um 
how often do those kind of things happen and is it kind of once every five years or are they quite regular yeah so regarding the network i think it's constantly improving but it's a matter of matter of funding funding and more bureaucratic stuff like i think i'm not sure if i'm if this is really correct but the the governments in the region have quite a lot of control on where you can place certain stations um a lot of the existing stations from what i know exist close to um, urban hotspots there's quite a few near jakarta in indonesia near kuala lumpur in malaysia and some along papua new guinea where there's some uh, coastal communities but within the more rural locations where in some ways the impacts of extreme rainfall probably likely to be more detrimental they may not be on a kind of looking at in terms of like gdp but more impacts to their livelihoods i'd say because they some rely on agriculture for example as a way, means of living um i'm not sure if i can see it improving you'd hope it would but but now you have to use the existing dates to fill in the gaps and the other question was about campaigns so um tend to be usually a couple of years but it depends on the institution where you're based in the world so we were meant to have one of, of people who go to leaves they probably have heard me rant on about there was a project that was meant to happen in um, Java so we we're meant to have some flights between Java and Christmas Island to get some insight into how convection and rainfall forms over the region there it was cancelled for four years in a row and this year was the final saying no it can't happen unfortunately due to some bureaucratic stuff um, but the insights you can get can get from campaigns is immense and um, it's a really it's really annoying that we can't do it but i understand there's a lot of funding that goes into it and they're not that easy to organize so yeah sarah um so most of my work is understanding the processes and more of the hindcasts in terms of understanding what's happened in the past and if there are any general trends that appear. Um, there's no current plans to look at, say, climate uh, projections, but it's definitely that some of that can be implemented because in the regions, one of the most prone to changes in changes changes in um, ocean temperature surface temperatures, which can influence the formation of like tropical cyclones so there's been an increase i think in the number of cyclones coming from the pacific ocean due to warming in the sector near the philippines so you may have heard the news there's been a lot quite a few been hit in the philippines recently um but unfortunately with my work it's very very much limited currently just to looking using the reanalysis data coupling with satellite observations and then seeing how the models represent them basically say are we representing them as well as we can so base so using the lower <laughs> and higher resolution models different kinds of the model physics in terms of representing these various processes and seeing if we can capture them which can then be implemented into the forecast models and there are some other people within say my research group who are looking at the more forecasts and statistical processes for projections which can be say actively implemented and they probably do more direct work with um, the agencies such as institutions like BMKG, which is a meteorological organization in Jakarta, I believe. So it's yeah, more of the high cast work at the moment. But hope in the future the I can use some of the model work for more of the forecasts because of with the change in climate or the changed climate even. Um, there are active, there are definitely some trends and changes we are seeing as we go along with this work. So yeah. So with the more local observations, as I said earlier, they're quite sparse in terms of geographical location. So um, these can include flight campaigns, um, ship um, campaigns, I guess. Um, 
and just stated the campaigns are run from meteorological stations across the maritime continent. Um, there's a whole host of data out there and there are organizations such as I think it's the University of Wyoming, they, I think they work with the partners across the region in terms of the um, stations that deploy weather balloons. So you can act, you can just download data that basically shows the atmospheric profile, the different temperatures, humidity, insight into radar retrievals of rainfall. Um, but it's, you have to dig for them and you have to give credit to the people who obviously produce the data, who the, the data is likely to influence the communities there. Um, there's also some work on more local knowledge about rainfall, so more the social cultural aspects and like how that influences forecasts. So in some regions where rainfall is seen as, I guess, in a way of their reliance on it for agricultural purposes. So um, there are some communities which have a, I can't remember what the term in Indonesian is, but they have a crop calendar. So they, they have this calendar where, which they refer to and they almost preemptively can forecast the weather by just changing the configuration of their crops. And usually it's a perfect match. They know when um, the rainfall is going to come. And it's that, it's some, it would be great to integrate some of that local knowledge into the work, but to be able to communicate with the locals without appearing intrusive, uh, interfering with, say, their livelihoods, but also be able to collaborate with them and give them the acknowledgement they want, as well as with the data you get from the stations and all that. There's a lot of work you have to do, a lot of paperwork, I guess, so, and gain consent for things. So, yeah, there's definitely potential for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to, because we're about one minute late, I'm going to thank just to stop the questions there and thank, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, to another round of applause to Asha and all our speakers. Um, that's it for today, but do keep an eye out on your emails for the next talk. Um, we'll get a date to you at some point. And um, yeah, hope to see you again soon. Thanks for joining either in person or online.